Globus. Gina, thank you. That, that, that was incredibly inspiring, but you've also put me in an incredibly difficult position. I mean, how do you start a discussion about the economy and about Japan after a quote from Bob Dylan? <laughs> I mean, so, so, but thank you for inspiring us. And, and, and I cannot resist to put our two panelists here on the spot. So Tom, what's your dream? <laughs> So, so remember how when Sheena led us through that exercise and she says, you don't show it to anyone. <laughs> so put yourself in my shoes. Did any of you write something down that you wouldn't want to share with uh, Jesper and the world? So it's, it's not that it's deeply personal. It's that if I read it to you, if you think I wrote this, imagining I would read it to you, it feels different. It's just please keep in your mind that I wrote this not knowing that Jesper was going to ask me. I'm sorry, I like putting Tom on the spot. Sorry, okay, enough preface. So here's my dream. So are you going to tell us? Yes, yes. I, 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 uh, Jesper was going to push me if you didn't push me. So, okay, so it says, dream that looking back a decade from now, the bold experiment called D4V, it's a, it's a venture firm, the bold experiment called D4V would be seen as a complete success and that it would have had a perceptible influence on entrepreneurship in Japan. So, so Tom has recently become a venture capitalist, and uh, you know, he believes in entrepreneurship, and he believes that particularly in Japan, helping to create an ecosystem for entrepreneurship will actually make Japan a better place and the world a better place. Now, Mogi-san. <laughs> now, you, you, you. Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, uh, mine is obvious, actually. I'm my, because, uh, it's obvious? Yeah, my, because my <laughs> mission statement on Twitter, fixed tweet or whatever, is to solve the mind-brain problem, to understand consciousness. So it's, I know it's a long shot, or it's a moon shot, or it's a Mars shot, or whatever. It's a, but it's my dream. And so, Sheena, I really appreciated your way uh, for kind of inducing us to write down the reasons for having this dream. Because it's not about this particular dream. I think it's about the emotions and reward structures, so to speak, that uh, involves this dream. So in my case, I think, uh, why, why do I uh, want to solve the mind-brain problem? Uh, I think it's because uh, it's the most, the deepest problem that we have as uh, humans. And also, uh, there will be um, you know, kind of an element of surprise, surprise, surprise when you solve it. And thirdly, and most importantly, uh, maybe, I want, it, I want to have uh, to feel as if I am connected to the universe or whatever, because you know we are living in a crazy world, and you know everybody is talking about money and <laughs> sorry, inventions, no money, no, no, yeah, yeah, inventions and success, and, but you know, well, let, let's face it, we are here only for a hundred years or so, and then we are gone, and we will probably never come back, depending on your religious belief. Maybe you come back, but you know. As far as I'm concerned, I will be gone. So I really want to understand, while I'm here, the conditions in which I'm here. But at the same time, it's, it's actually, it's not my day job, actually. It's something that I do at night or whatever. So, uh, well, dreams are for the night jobs, I think so. But, but anyway, it, yeah, so I really appreciate it. And I, I should really say, and actually I learned that you actually flew f from New York yesterday and you are flying back tomorrow? Yes. Um, can I just respond? Yeah, please. So I think that um, the reason why I think it's so important to reframe the question of why is because if you look at the research, so I, I, I am a psychologist by training. I'm trained as a social cognitive psychologist. I also have been influ influenced by behavioral economics. I suppose sure. you could say, even claim I'm guilty of participating in that world. And I'm also guilty of participating in the neuroscience world. And I would say that since the 1970s, we've had a lot of research that has essentially showed us in many, many ways in which we're biased, in which we're irrational, in which we avoid statistics, do all the things that we shouldn't be doing. Um, you know, like, you know, we, we cave into temptation problems and all kinds of things 
And my, my, what I'm essentially doing here is I'm saying stop trying to rid yourself of biases. What I'm saying here is there is a structured way in which you can segregate the part of decision making that is quote unquote rational, whatever word we want to use about that, and then there's another part of the structure that is emotional and embrace those emotions. There's no need to constantly conflate the problem part with the emotional part or the rational part with the emotional part. We can segregate those two and they do both serve very important functions in our ability to create. I can agree. I cannot agree with you more. I, I'm, a, I'm a physicist by training, and so I'm, you know, all, you know, I, I really understand your point about statistics and so on. And, and artificial intelligence, you know, all these, you know, wonderful uh, intelligent machines, they are based on, you know, statistical learning and so on. So, you know, I, I understand. And still, we do have these irrational, emotional dimensions as well. So, I think she you know, has just made a really important point that uh, maybe. By separating, by realizing there are two dimensions uh, to our existence, maybe we can, you know, hope to build a better world and by you know improving ourselves first and so on. So, but by the way, how do you connect this argument to sustainability and <laughs> Japan? Uh, Mogi san quite frankly, I was hoping you would give me the answer. Right? I don't know. But, what I mean, but, you know, I'm a huge how, fan of this because you know, there's, there's all I, this. How about if I, I I offer an opinion on that? Just, oh, please, yeah. Yes. Yes. yeah but, 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 no, no, you go ahead with yeah, your opinion, yeah, please, please. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I think that the way we have been talking about and conceptualizing innovation, no matter what the domain is, is just not done in a way that's workable because it's just too rationally based. Like, why, why would people care about the environment when the only thing they realize is, oh, well, 100 years from now, maybe my grandchildren or my great-grandchildren. I mean, yes, the socially conscious of us, particularly the knowledgeable ones of us, will say, yeah, you really should reduce the number of plastics and really should reduce this, that, and the other. But if you really want the, the masses to really care about it, it has to be emotional. That's when we. That's when we care about it. So it's, it, it, it's it's obvious about lots of things in which we make changes. So that's how it's relevant. Whether you're talking about sustainability or a bazillion other, uh, I'm really talking about what, what I'm talking about is agnostic to the domain of innovation. No, I think that that's hugely important. And I mean, I sometimes pick a fight. It's like you know, there's a lot of. I mean, you know, if I ask here who's in favor of Mr. Trump, probably nobody dares to raise their hand, right? But I mean, whether you like it or not, he was capable of getting the emotional buy-in, right, of the majority of at least the electoral college, or however that is worked out, right? You know, so you know, you've got to be sexy, you've got to be erotic, right? Uh, it's not about just cold data analysis. We need human emotional intelligence. AI is easy, right? <laughs> emotional <laughs> yeah, intelligence easy. is the difficult part of things. Now. I'm going to pivot very quickly, right, Mogisan? Sustainability, right? <laughs> no, but it's interesting, right? I mean, you've got this wonderful backdrop here, right? And I think it's perfect, you know, to sort of bring, you know, sort of closure to a long day of discussions. I mean, you got hit with a lot of different things, and as I'm sure your head is buzzing and spinning, right? So how do you actually bring it together? And it's funny, right? Sustainable innovation in times of disruption. Uh, Horisan? What does that actually mean? <laughs> no, but, but look, and, and I'm as guilty as the next guy, right? I mean, you throw around these things that are slogans that are, you know, sort of sexy at the moment. Um, mo, 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 mo. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, so, he's the smartest man in Japan. No, no, no. That's how he was introduced no, to no. me. But, but Mogi-san, sustainable <laughs> for you. What is sustainable? Well, in Japan, we have a really beautiful uh, example in... It's a grand shrine. I think you know, we uh, 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 the Japanese people can at least be proud of it's a shrine because it has been rebuilt every 20 years for the last uh, three uh, 1,300 years, I think. And you know, in order to do that, you really need to plan very carefully ahead. Uh, you have you have to have a certain 
kind of uh, logs uh, of cedar trees. And in order to do that, you have to plant the trees hundreds of years ahead, uh, believing that generations, generations, generations later, uh, they would be able to use that log to rebuild the shrine again. And so it's a whole ecosystem. And, you know, it's, and the most wonderful part of it is that I have had the privilege of talking to some people who are working at the Ise Shrine. And these are not you know, necessarily you know, people with really extraordinary talents or qualifications or something. These are people, ordinary people, just you, like you and me. You know, uh, but they come into the ecosystem of Ise Shrine. And although they do not actually have grand ideas of, uh, about sustainability or ecology or so on, they just do their jobs. And as a result, voila, you have all these wonderful you know, um, uh, history and tradition being carried on. So I, I think this is a great lesson because, as probably uh, Sheena mentioned, uh, we have too many people who have you know, who put forward grand ideas about sustainability and so on. But you know, too many grand ideas, but too little uh, actual uh, endeavors, I think, in the world today. So I think that Ise Grand Shrine is a great lesson in sustainability, especially when you talk about the sustainability of a system involving many, many people uh, with different qualifications, different orientations, diversity of people, are working in effect together to realize something that is sustainable for a long, long uh, period of time. And so it, it's, it's very interesting because, I mean, you know, my God, we all love Japan. And my God, you look at the Ise Shrine, it's like, wow. I mean, the chances of this thing still operating in the same way in a thousand years is pretty high. I don't think you can say that about a lot of things. Tom, yes. sustainability, what do you think? Sure. <laughs> so. Sustainability, you know, if you say that in modern American English in the U.S., sustainability always means uh, for the earth. It is, a, it is a statement about ecology. But if you back up just a tiny bit, as the title for today's talk was about sustainable, then it has one of two meanings. It either means for the long-term benefit of the earth, or it may, me, means something that you can begin today and continue successfully for a long time, right? And I, when I first looked at the, the, today's event, I took it to mean that latter meaning, right? How can we create new ideas? How can we put, push forward or build on current ideas in Japan in a way that sustains the culture, that sustains the commerce, that sustains the nation for a long time going into the future? And so, that, that was my interpretation. When you ask Hori-san the question, you know, like, what did he mean? That, that was my guess as to what the answer was. He could, he actually no, knows we, the answer. We, <laughs> we can find out from Hori, him. Hori, Hori-san <laughs> apparently knows all the answers. Um, Sheena, sustainable. I, I actually thought, I, I really loved what Mogi-san said, because if you think about one of the inventions of, of humans, it, it's God and we don't have any proof of it. Uh, we continue to innovate on what it is and how we're going to celebrate it, and we keep coming up with different kinds of structures and arts and ideologies associated with it, and we're willing to create for it, die for it, do all kinds of crazy things for it, but we've actually never had any proof of it, and yet it goes on. So I loved the Bob Dylan quote. Right? Um, I'm more of a... You, you wanted to be Bob Dylan no, in I, earlier I, no, life. No, no, I think my sister wanted to be Bob Dylan. Um, I'm more of a Led Zeppelin guy, but um, never mind. Um, life is about creating yourself. And I actually think, and now I'm really going to pivot, Japan is in a fantastic and phenomenal position. Right? Because whether you like Prime Minister Abe or not, I, I do not care. He is providing stability. These people run the country. They will be around. 
They are not doing anything weird or strange. And they are very much pro-business, pro-entrepreneurship, pro-private sector. And Japan is you know, in a unique position because the rest of the world is so weird at the moment. <laughs> but this is where the creating your own story, your own success. We cannot blame the Bank of Japan. We cannot blame governor, uh, sorry, uh, uh, you know, the, the, what, what's the name of the finance minister? Asosan, right? <laughs> I mean, taxes go up, taxes go down, fine, right? But the reality is Japan is in this unique position right now. And so what, and it's on us, it's on the entrepreneurs, it's on the business leaders, right? It's on the team leaders to actually make the best because the environment in Japan is stable. And thereby, hopefully, Japan can become an example right, to the rest of the world. Now, Tom, I'm going to pick on you again. Sure, of course you are. So I'd what, be what, disappointed if you didn't. So what are you doing right, with this domestic stability that we've got in Japan? Yes. Right? What are you doing to, make, you know, to, to, to face the challenges and to, to, to use this as an opportunity? Sure. You know, this gets at a question I get a lot in the Silicon Valley. So uh, I split my time now between Japan and the Silicon Valley where I, where I live. And when I meet with friends at events and in social uh, contexts in the Silicon Valley, I always get the same question, uh, which is, well, wait, Tom, why Japan? Right? Because if you stand back, you know, there's 200 sovereign nations on Earth, and if you wanted to start a venture capital somewhere on Earth, apparently, if you live in the Silicon Valley, you wouldn't pick Japan. It wouldn't be the, it's not the first one they think of. They, they question the, the idea of it. And so I'll tell you why Japan. Because this is a pretty, I mean, I fell in love with Japan my first trip, 1985. But this is a pretty remarkable place, and it feels to me like Japan has everything it needs to be wonderfully successful in entrepreneurship in exactly the same way it has been so successful in the last you know, 80 years in the, the corporate model sometimes referred to as, as Japan Inc. Right? And so if you believe that Japan is at some sort of inflection point where with just the tiniest little nudge we can, we can ignite entrepreneurship in Japan, then this is exactly the right place to be in the world. My esteemed colleague uh, here on the panel is suggesting that I'm here for the money, no, no, right? No. That it's, uh, I'm not saying that, right? no. And, and actually, on the contrary, um, this, is, this is about, you know, I'm old enough, I'm the oldest person on the panel by a lot, I'm old enough to start thinking about one's legacy. And so uh, the reason I'm in Japan is because it seems like a, a place just ripe for innovation. And the reason that I wrote my goal, my dream, uh, had nothing to do with money. I'll tell you what it had to do with. Met a young lady in a bus stop in Sydney, Australia in 1987. And when it came time, for my lovely Japanese girlfriend at the time <laughs> to tell her Japanese parents in, up in Hokkaido that she wanted to marry a gaijin. This was not a happy moment, let me just say. <laughs> I don't know if any of you have wrestled with this on either side of this equation, but it's not the dream of the average parents in Hokkaido that their, that their uh, only daughter would marry a boy like me, right? Did you have hair at the time? I had hair. I had a oh, lot yeah. oh, okay. of hair. I had more hair than Bob Dylan <laughs> Okay, <the> okay. Time. <laughs> and um, so to make a difference in Japan today, you know, I could be anywhere in the world. I, I was a global company. I could have picked anywhere. To make a difference in Japan today over the next few years, right, that would complete the cycle, right? All that skepticism, you know, it's like, oh, uh, you know, that boy, you want to marry that boy? Wow, to make a big difference now, that would, that would settle all my accounts. And that's, that's it, it, the, it's, it's the always very important to have clarity of motive. Yes. Right? <laughs> now, your second question, guys. 
Just, just for 30 <laughs> seconds, you know, for 30 seconds, uh, it's, it's late in the day, but there is one number that you need to know. Um, if you want to increase the probability of sustained economic growth, the best thing you can do is raise the number of entrepreneurs. And you can do the studies, you will find if you raise the number of entrepreneurs by 1% of the total population, your sustained economic growth rate, right, your potential growth rate goes up by about half a percent, which is enormous. It's not taxes going up or down. It's not interest rates going up or down. The one thing that is a proven concept, whether it's in uh, Nigeria, whether it is in Sweden, whether it's in Silicon Valley, whether it's in Japan, you raise the number of entrepreneurs, your potential economic growth rate actually increases. Now, Sheena, Japan, you've been a long-term fan of Japan. Right now, in the environment that we have right now, apart from inspiring us to dream, which is cool. I mean, when was the last time somebody actually urged you, you should dream more? That's very, wow, I'm going to go to Colombia. By, by the way, your, cur your comment about two seconds ago. I just want to make my wife happy. That's all I want to do. Increasing <laughs> entrepreneurship would increase by 1%. What do you think in inspires somebody to start their own business? It's not because they want to save the nation. No, exactly. They want to create their own path. Yeah, exactly. They have a dream, they want to open up blah 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 shop that sells blah 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 because they want to prove something to somebody and there you have it. That's exactly right. Now, what are you doing in the current environment right now, right, to sort of, you know, seize the Japanese moment? What am I doing here in Japan, you mean? Yeah. Well, I just came here for a day. I leave the rest of it <laughs> up to you guys. <laughs> I just told you all to dream, and hopefully that's enough. <laughs> no, you, 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 you told us how to dream. What do you dream about? What do I dream about? Mm -hmm. um, I guess I dream about two things. Um, I do dream about being somebody that is enabled to inspire others to dream and turn their dreams into realities through ideating, right? And I suppose the second thing I dream about is to have more love. Oh my God. <laughs> dream? Love. Uh, Mogi-san, help me out. What, what, yeah, what, yeah, yeah, yeah. What are you, what are you doing to make Japan I, a better place? Yeah, I, I really appreciate uh, Shino's unique individuality. I, I, you know, I really appreciate it. You know, what, uh, just, just, uh, what I have been doing in this country for the last few years, I think, is in a nutshell to make us realize that we are a diverse nation. Uh, you know, we have this ideology that Japan is a, a you know, homogeneous you know, nation, but that's, that is really far from true. I mean, uh, we have this wonderful proverb, Jun in Toiro, 10 people, 10 colors. That's the reality. Hey, people, wake up. We are a diverse nation. We have all kinds of people, and that's the strength of Japan as a nation. Look, look at the Japanese food. You know, we have all these different ingredients cooked in different ways. Uh, we have even have different wares. If you have a kaiseki dinner, every ware is different. So, you know, diversity and this idea that we should have many different elements in our life is a hallmark of Japanese culture. But I, I don't think many Japanese people uh, realize that because Japanese media tend to portray Japan as a homogeneous, you know, you know everywhere same nation, but that's not true. So what I, you know, I, you know I'm a neuroscientist and I study the brain. So I, I think one of the really important things that you can do about as a, you know, as a, in the public science domain as a neuroscientist is to uh, make people realize how how diverse we are in terms of our abilities, personalities, ways of communications, so that every unique character, every unique personality is okay. There is no hierarchy, there's no rating system. That, so that's, that's the message that I have been hope, hopefully uh, portraying, portraying to the Japanese populace for the last you know, few years. 
Uh, you mentioned Mr. Abe very much, and you, I, I know you are a great fan. So, <laughs> well, but Mr. Abe is, also has a very unique personality. So it's okay. You know, and so the, uh, every other political uh, figures has their own, own personality. Look at uh, Mr. Trump or you know Johnson, Mr. Johnson. So you know, we we should you know when even when criticize when you criticize these people, you should start by appreciating their own unique individuality. So I think in that sense, Japan can contribute to the conversations in the global political. Uh, discussion because too often in the global domain, people start from the assumption of right or wrong, or you know, right or left, or you know, liberal or conservative. I think uh, the unique feature of Japan's uh, political debate probably is that we are sometimes free from this labeling business, you know. Right. Do, don't you feel that way? Yeah. Yeah, no, there's, there's a wonderful degree of freedom, right, uh, that there is, and it's actually, you know, a much clearer debate. I mean, going to the United States right now is scary, right? I mean, as a snooty European, I'm from Germany, right? Um, you, know, you know, we always say, oh, Americans are boring, you know, because Americans, they don't talk about sex, religion, and politics, right? Now you go to America, and my God, do they talk about politics, but in what weird ways, Right? Because exactly yeah. compartmentalized, right? the distrust between the Democrats and the Republican is just so enormous. While here in Japan, you actually do have a debate, right? Mogi-san, Tom, Sheena, disruption. Oh, yeah, yeah, we forgot so, that. So okay. how does Japan deal with disruption? disruption? I mean, Japan hates disruption. I mean, look at Issei. We all love Issei, right? Let's disrupt the way he said they should be using AI to pick the best trees. No, no, right? Well, anyway, but where, where does disruption come in? Because, you know, so you've got a dream. You want to realize the dream. But then the Kedan Ren, sorry, if there's anybody here from the Kedan Ren, you know, they tell you, no, 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 you're stupid. And by the way, I want to protect my own little interest, right? So where does disruption, you know, come in in your mind, Tom? Sure, disruption uh, is a little bit harder in a place like Japan where a lot of things are pretty perfect, right? And life is pretty comfortable. It's a, a kind of a known factor in our work in doing design and innovation that you have to get people to the edge of their comfort zone before they're willing to actually start changing. There's a program at Stanford University in what they call the D School. D stands for design thinking. It's an executive ed program that I highly recommend. It's called, uh, it's called Boot Camp. And I, I'm not a Stanford guy at all. I never took a class at Stanford. I went to a competing school. But I did interview 100 people who went to that D School, and 100 out of 100 said it changed their life. But in the executive program, the people who run the program tell me they first thing they have to do, they try to do it in the first hour, is to get these very self-confident senior executives, get them to fail at least once. He says, after they get to their first failure, then I have their attention, right? And so if you want to disrupt, you have to actually believe that disruption is necessary or appropriate or urgent. And so I think in our work here in Japan, we have uh, 35 people in a very nice building designed by Kuma Kengo and, and called One Omote Sando. Um, when we're working with our Japanese clients, we, we have to build up the, the desire to change uh, because that's a, that's a pretty, unless you want to have some exogenous variable come in and ruin your life, uh, you, you know, it's better, it's more pleasant to develop that, that desire for change internally. And so I think that's a prerequisite to, to the disruption. Ken. Yeah, oh, that's a really fair point. And uh, I think the Japanese actually love uh, disruption. The Japanese love disruption? Yeah, yeah. When, How when, many when, think that that's true? <laughs> when, 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 when... God, you're weird. When, <laughs> when it is made into a festivity, like, do you, you know the, uh, the movement, Asia Naika, at the end of the Tokugawa era? No, never heard of it. It's a, it was a kind of festival. Right? People, you know, 
w going out into the streets and you know dancing and that was the zeitgeist at the time in the Tokugawa shogunate was kind of nearing its end and the major restorations nearing and people kind of felt that and they you know danced this Asian Aika festivity so I I think you know uh, it's not like the United States uh, Japanese people have you know kind of a doing together thing. You're not in this confrontation thing. So, for example, Uber or Airbnb, mm. if you can devise a really um, clever way of making these into festivals, like Uber festival, <laughs> Airbnb festival, <laughs> Japanese people would love it, right? And, you know. <laughs> I mean it. You would be a fantastic CEO. <laughs> um, we've got a little bit of time. Um, please, don't be shy. Any questions for the audience here? And you've got great topics. Dreams, love, you know, sustainability. We didn't even talk about innovation because <laughs> Sheena, Sheena said that she doesn't know the first thing about it. Ha uh ha. -huh. Um, and then disruption. Please, anybody from the audience, any, any question, any, uh, you know, question. And it's, it's German rules. Um, so if it's not a question, and if you haven't asked a question within 30 seconds, you, you know, you will have to pay for the after party. <laughs> oh, dear. Dozo in the back there. Who are you? Hi, my name is Matthew. Um, <clears throat> we heard the panelists' dream, but we didn't hear your dream, Jesper. Yeah, no, that, that yeah, comes yeah, at yeah. the very yeah, end, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jesper, yeah. You know what? It, I, I will tell you my dream, and it's, it's a huge and massive failure, but I keep on dreaming. I want to compose and direct an opera. What? It's always been my, like, you know, no you, kidding. You, you wanted to become a pilot. I wanted to become a, <laughs> Richard Wagner. No, I, really? I, I wanted to, no, no, it's not really. Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, see, see what Kathy has to say about that. <laughs> So that was my dream. Th that was the question? Good. Next question. <laughs> Anybody else? Meanwhile, Jesper, I think we can help you with that. We just hired an opera singer at IDEO last week. Swear to God. Professional. I mean, she, she's, it's not like uh, uh, she did this for fun. Soprano? Uh, so, uh, soprano? Oh, does, wow. Does, does okay. Davide, do you know the answer to that? I don't know if she's a soprano oh, or not. Oh, there she is. Is it, Hi. Is she, Enora oh, Rogers. I, okay, my question is. Who are you? Enora Rogers, uh, Enora Rogers Inc. I do biomedical product development. But my question is, you mentioned that Japan being stable is a plus in this situation, and I'd like to understand more about that because, in my experience, being in a just in a disruptive situation is actually what spurs on innovation and development. Wait, I thought that was a question for you. Yeah, yeah, because you said you, 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 you yeah. <laughs> You made a statement about that. No. Yeah. So I made the statement because, you know, from a macroeconomic perspective, right, Japan is stable. It's providing stability. So it's up to you. It's up to your dream. It's up to your entrepreneurship, right, to actually make things happen. When there is an earthquake, when the yen goes from 110 to 90 or to 80, then, of course, everybody changes. I get that, right? But now is the environment where the better part of humanity the better part of creativity is being actually presented with a fantastic opportunity to make things happen. That's what I meant by that. Please, in the back. Uh, Tatsuo Master, I have a question to uh, Dr. Mogi. In your understanding, yeah. what was the largest disruption in the Japanese history? Whether it's a Sekigahara war or Meiji oh restoration or what else? Thank you. Oh my God. I don't want to, you know, uh, go very political, but uh, probably to, to, uh, I think it's, it would be fair to say that it was the Second World War and its end and occupation of Japan, because this was the first experience. And I think to this day, uh, the relationship between Japan and the U.S. kind of defines the you know status quo in this country so i'm a great fan of the united states especially when it comes to the spirit of innovation and so i i think you know you were working in this context of post war japan are you have you ever have you ever worked for the ghq asking. or 
<laughs> I'm just so this 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 still is the single important element I think in Japanese history and you know uh, we have many people who went to Harvard like this guy there <laughs> hi Hori san <laughs> yeah so Japan U.S. relationship I think this is very important do you have any comment on that well, of course Germany is also very important <laughs> but you know. <laughs> Dozo, side to side. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, you escaped. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Please, please, please say. Uh, can I just say something about disruption? Yeah. I think we overrate disruption. Oh, okay. That's good. Cool. I, I don't, I think we act as if just having disruption unto itself for its own sake is somehow this really positive thing. And I actually don't think that that's, that's the source of a lot of fun. It makes people feel good if they can feel like they're part of a disruptive environment and they're engaging and somehow they're in an exciting world. But I don't actually think that's where real creativity comes from. Um, I mean, if you go back to the economist Schumpeter, sustainable innovation comes from new combinations of old ideas. And so what does that mean? It, you know, when people have problems, like in the case of the earthquake, like in the case of after World War II, like in the case of the fact that now people are more conscious of what they're eating. That's suddenly become a problem, right? When people see there's a problem that needs to be solved, it's amazing how much more innovation happens. I mean, I today now drink oat milk every morning in my cappuccino. <laughs> I never even heard of that stuff. And I don't know whether it's really better for me than cow's milk or whether they've just convinced me of this so that, you know, the farmers making oat milk can also make some money. And we can d redistribute the wealth a little bit. But you see my point? I, I actually think it has to be a problem that people are solving. The way you would get people to be more actively engaged rather than suddenly creating disruption, I would just make them more aware of different ways in which people do things and different problems that exist. Too many times we get stuck in a very narrow echo chamber. I want to add on to this a little story. Um, about three years ago, I was on a panel at the Kedan Ren, and it was about innovation, disruption, and all that. And one of the gods of technology from Silicon Valley was on the panel. And he was going on about self-driving cars, right? He was going on about self-driving cars, fantastic. We've got to disrupt the whole thing. And I got very ida ida, right? And I sort of said, excuse me, you are visiting Tokyo. We already have self-driving cars. It's called a subway. <laughs> now, of course, this, this, this gentleman is known to be very Italian. Um, and he says, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. Self-driving cars this, self-driving cars that, efficiency this, efficiency that. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm just an economist. For an economist, there's only one difference between a self-driving car and the subway, which is that with the subway, the equity is owned by the people. With a self-driving car, there is three guys who get filthy rich. It was the only time I got a standing ovation from the k right? <laughs> but the point being, you know, we didn't even talk about some of the political economies that are out there, right? And, you know, you've got to be very, very aware that some of the disruptive forces in the way, you know, those companies and those industries are being structured, that actually you end up further accelerating the inequality, right? Whether it's in income, whether it's in wealth, right? That actually is at the root cause of a lot of the political disruptive and the socially disruptive forces, you know, that we've got in the rest of the world. And of course, you know, for better or for worse, you know, Japan has done a reasonably good job, right, at actually maintaining, um, you know, income as well as wealth, you know, equality, while at the same time offering opportunity. Just, I, I, you know, just, you know, you, 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 what you said, uh, uh, made me think about one thing, which is maybe the Japanese dream is different from the American dream. The American dream is, you know, starting a company and becoming filthy rich. But, you know, <laughs> I'm sorry, yeah, but, but, <laughs> but the Japanese dream is probably different from that. So I, I, I think they, they, they want to get filthy rich and then get taxed. <laughs> well, I'm not saying that, you know, but, you know, because I meet many young people 
who dream of starting their own company. But you know, their dreams often seem to be different from the American dream, you know, kind of a, so they want to contribute more to the society and more, it's more about sharing and more about building communities and so on. So I think what you have just said is probably something really diff important uh, when we think about the future of Japan. Yeah, yeah. Shina, do you have a comment on the, on, the, on the difference in dreams between Japan and the United States? Or should we discuss that when we've had a drink? <laughs> I think we should definitely discuss it once we've had a drink. But okay. <laughs> there, there is one thing you just said, though, that reminded me, since I know you like, like quotes, there's, there's another quote that you reminded me of hmm? when you were telling your story about the Japanese subway. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the, the French polymath, Henri Poincaré, Right. He said once that invention consists of avoiding the constructing of useless combinations. It consists <laughs> of the constructing of useful combinations, which are an infinite minority. Fantastic. So I think we're, we're running out of time. I'd like to see if we can put things together here uh, in a few <laughs> phrases. Good luck, Terry. So you've talked about sustainable. You've talked about inv innovation. You've talked about disruption. But up there on the sign, it says, better society. So my question for each of the panelists, better society in Japan. What changes? One thing. What remains the same? One thing. OK, so I'm going to go with 90% change stays the same. Love Japan, could come any, go anywhere. I come here you know, more than once a month. What changes? Let me just try a micro view. So Jesper's so amazing at the macro. I'm going to try, to try a micro, micro, micro suggestion. This morning at the very beginning, Prime Minister Abe came on. and He could have talked about anything he wanted. He only spoke for a few minutes, but right at the end, he talked about plastics in the ocean. So uh, Japan is so far ahead of us on many things, but in California, we're trying to make a small dent in that at least. And so we eliminated those plastic bags you get in the kombini. Like, it was effortless. It was effortless to do that. And now I'm uncomfortable every time they offer it to me. Like, wait, you want me to use that once and take it to my hotel room and then throw it away and then send it straight to the ocean? Like, this is a really easy change to make. Just, just give it up. You know, like, we, we don't need those bags. You do like they do in Europe and carry a little bag around. You use a paper, like, when I come to Japan, pre, you know, before California changed our laws, I, would, I could accumulate 20 to 30 plastic bags in a single week, right? And then lots of plastic straws and plastic forks and spoons to go with it. This would be, you, you want to do, make one small step because, you know, G1 is all, all about actions, not just ideas. This is so easy to change. Just, just do it. It, 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 it. it won't be hard on anyone. And I don't know what the number adds up to for a nation the size of Japan, but uh, that's a lot of plastic bags in the ocean every day. Yeah, uh, uh, I would like to see more women in post, right, in companies and universities and organizations. In, ca in, the, in the cabinet, Pre uh, presently we have two ministers, but we need more. And secondary, we need more expatriates here in this country. And, I mean, we, this is wonderful. Uh, we have probably uh, gender equal audience, and also uh, we have many people from all over the world. I heard 30 different countries at least. So this is the future of Japan. This room is the future of Japan. So I, you know, although we, we like to keep our culture and tradition in a nice way, we need you know, more you know, people from all over the world and joining us, and like the rugby Japan team. I mean, I heard that rugby Japan, uh, they, it's constituted of, <laughs> thank you, thank you. I, I think half of the, half of the, half of the players uh, uh, this time is uh, from, abroad, like New Zealand, Australia, and so on, Korea, and so on. So I think this is great. So, Sheena, yeah. what, what do you think? What in Japan stays the same? What changes? So I think what's great about this country is the, the real trust and safety. I mean, you could lose anything anywhere, and it's back, including cash. <laughs> <laughs> 
trust me, my, my son once lost like $500 in Tokyo, and three days later, it was given to him in the subway. Wow. Yeah. Um, Kathy knows the story. Um, <clears throat> then um, the thing I would change here, though, and it's a, just like Tom, I would go at the very, very micro level. I, I do feel that since I started coming here in 1995, it would be better if the Japanese people were more open to communicating with more foreigners, yeah. um, whether it be in the form of friends, whether it be in the form of, I mean, I don't even care what it is, dating, friendships, working, just, it, it's just in terms of giving yourself more exposure to other ideas, I do think innovation will come from that because you're generally exposed to a lot more different ways of thinking. Okay. 20 years later, after the World War II, uh, we uh, hosted uh, Olympic 1964. We had three uh, innovations which are still sustainable. One is Shinkansen system uh, and uh, to promote um, import at this moment of time. Uh, second is the uh, central kitchen system to provide many uh, hot food to various people. And the third is uh, private uh, security system, uh, such as SECOM. Those are the inventions that uh, we are proud of still. Now, a uh, half century later, we are, sorry, we are celebrating Olympic uh, 2020. What are those innovations? I don't know which would be sustainable or not in the future, but what are the equivalent, comparable innovation here in Japan? I don't see any. Thank okay, you. excellent. Okay, the back there. There. Uh, I have a question to Tom. Yep. Uh, to answer the question of why Japan, you said Japan is ripe for change or innovation. What makes you feel Japan is ripe for change or innovation? And also, you mentioned with a few tiny triggers, uh, you can have it, you can ignite Japan. What could be those tiny few triggers? Excellent. And one in the back. Yes, thanks. I'm Jenny Corbett from the Foundation for Australia-Japan Studies, and it's a question for Mori-san. I really liked your point about diversity in Japan, that this is something that goes unnoticed. But it's still true that for many Japanese, maybe most Japanese, in many circumstances, they prefer to behave as if it was a homogenous yeah. society. So my question is, where, what part of upbringing or education system do you need to change in Japan to make people feel more comfortable about celebrating that diversity? Great. Tom, you're up. Sure. Uh, why, why did I feel the way about Japan? If you roll back the clock a decade or more, it felt like there was no entrepreneurship in Japan. And I'm just talking from my own personal experience. It didn't appear on my radar screen. And back in that era, uh, a, a young man said to me, you know, Tom, if you, if you start your own company instead of joining a big, reliable uh, Japanese uh, you know, corporation, it reduces your chance of getting a girlfriend. And, you know, and I laughed and I thought, no, this is real. This is a human, you know, it it's, it's, gets back to what she was saying about, you know, driven by emotion. If a young entrepreneur believes that, that because of parental disapproval, they will not be able to get a girlfriend or a boyfriend or a, or a wife or a husband, that is real. That is a, that is a motivator, right? And so uh, in the ensuing years, the little by little entrepreneurship has, has grown, and I've seen it in a hundred different ways, including the Slush event, Slush Tokyo event, every year. And so now, I just, we need to make it socially acceptable. We need to have money available. We need to have a support network for entrepreneurship. And I think that will not be hard. I'd like to believe that our little firm is going to be a part of that process of unlocking. Yeah, uh, I think for many Japanese people, uh, celebrating diversity feels like as if they have to go out of their comfort zone. But uh, I think it's the other way around, I think. You know, if you really realize each other's diversity and respect it, you become more relaxed, like you are as if you are in an onsen and, you know, <laughs> hot spring. And uh, so I think this can be learned only through experience. So I think it is very important for Japanese uh, children to have um, an experience where they are exposed to diversity in a very natural way. So I think that's all 
all the, that's why I, I think it's very important to uh, have all these people from all over the world because you know by meeting with people uh, from other countries, they one they realize that people speak different languages and pe have different cultures, and two, comparing the Japanese kids with um, people from all over the world, they probably would realize that really a rich um, spectrum of diversity that actually exists within the Japanese populace. So I, I think, you know, you know uh, to realize that, to appreciate diversity is actually a very relaxing, rewarding experience. I think that's a key element of education in the near future. I'm going to very quickly answer your question on the three products. Uh, if you are in any component world, right, you cannot do without Japanese products. Now, that's not the unit kitchen, which touches every housewife, every family directly. I totally get that, right? But in the world of base materials, of components, Japan is absolutely the undisputed leader of the world. 56% of the components of the world's best smartphones are done by Japanese companies and can only be done by Japanese companies. Finally, you're asking the wrong question. <laughs> because Japan is now a society where one in four is over the 65. As you know, the only reason I love being in Japan is because everybody else gets older faster than I do, which is brilliant, right? It's the 40th anniversary of the Sony Walkman. Right? Where is the Sony Walkman? Well, think about it. Marikon. Marie Kondo, right? What she's done is probably the most successful Japanese mass consumer export, right? That we have seen over the last couple of years. It's a mind chat, right? That's actually going on because you can throw away your socks after you say goodbye, you know, you've been very nice to me uh, type of thing. But Anyway, post-industrialism. I want to thank the panel. I want to thank the audience for having uh, you know, uh, stood with us here. Wonderful panel, wonderful audience. Thank you very much.